London in 1886. Then the largest city in human history and the center of the known world. With its self-importance, its dirt, its wealth and awful poverty, it seems a mystery to us now. It was a different world, an entirely different world. But there is a guide to this human jungle. Charles Booth, Victorian London's social explorer. Booth produced a series of pioneering maps that color-coded the streets of his London according to the ever-shifting class of its residents. Booth's maps are like scans, x-rays that reveal to us the secret past beneath the skin of the present. If people knew how many cattle was killed there, I don't think they'd live there. <laughs> He wanted his maps to chart stories of momentous social change. And those houses were the lowest of the low. The ebb and flow between enormous wealth and terrible poverty. How easily desirable or well-to-do neighborhoods could descend into the haunts of the vicious and semi-criminal and back again. Now the maps can help us reveal the changes that have shaped all our lives and made the story of the streets the story of us all. Oh my Beautiful. goodness, the old toilet's gone. So we're going back to one of the tens of thousands of streets Booth mapped. To tell the story of how, sacrificed to new ideas of urban planning, a 200 year old community was bulldozed. For some unknown reason, they wanted to condemn Deptford. Deptford High Street, in the heart of London, just four miles from the financial capital of the world. A Victorian relic marooned amid 1970s sprawl. When Charles Booth arrived in 1899, it was booming the Oxford Street of South London. More than 100 years on, it's now one of the poorest high streets in the capital. This used to be fantastic. It's got finished. The story of Deptford High Street is of how it lost both its wealth and the community which had given it life. August 1899. 13 years into his epic survey of London, Charles Booth visits Deptford High Street, incorporating it into his vast social map of the city. Booth's map is a breakthrough, a new way to anatomize the complex lives of Londoners. And in a district rarely visited by respectable people, it throws up surprising results. Booth marks Deptford High Street as red for well-to-do, the second highest social ranking in the middle of one of London's poorest districts. It's a busy, thriving high street where traders live above their shops and prosper. Despite their working class origins, one in three shopkeeping families keeps at least one domestic servant. One family trading on the high street when Booth arrived is still here today. John Price owns the Bent Can discount shop, yards from where he was born and from where his people have always had market stalls. I don't know what we're going to do about the food prices, John. Robert keeps telling me I'm too dear. And I keep telling him he gets service. <laughs> and he don't get service. With a smile, no with a smile. And when John, he goes in Sainsbury's, they go dip. <laughs> and when he comes in here, I go, hello, Robert. <laughs> Who's the cheapest down there? Hey, what do you mean the cheapest? Don't go for the cheapest, you go for the best. What about Sainsbury's? Are they cheaper? Well, at least you'll come to my funeral. You're always going to Sainsbury's spending your money. I won't go to your funeral. Your family used to live in nearby streets around here. This one, yeah. All right, Edge, just going out a second. My grandfather was a Price. My grandmother was really an oval when they married together. So the Prices have probably been here about 250 years. The Ovenals, I think, have been here longer. We're uh, going down Owl Street. Down here is where we used to have our house. Just on this corner here. 
this, this was my nan's house. If it's hard to imagine now, but this used to be a gate. And that used to be our backyard. And that's where all the stalls used to be. Where's it gone? It's gone. It's, but they made it a road. The truth and they, they, they made it a road. The arch used to come here, down like that. Big arch coming through and used to pull the barrows all the way through. This used to take a hundred barrows. I mean, Nan's family, their house used to be here, right next to the pub. There's the pub. And their Obenall's house used to be here. And you see how easy it was. You used to fall out of bed and go to work on the stall at the top of the high street. Well, around about here, Christmas time, my father would be sharpening, looking through the window, and we'll all be sitting around the table there at Christmas. And we're all waiting for Dad, because he's half drunk, because he's been at the pub all day, you know? I mean, it's about four o'clock on Christmas, Christmas day, and we're all waiting for him to come in to carve the turkey so we can all get in and eat some food, you know what I mean? And there he is going like this with a knife. <laughs> we're all saying, is he going to fall over yet or not? <laughs> and you had all these beetroots, were beautiful. Beautiful, fresh cooked beetroots, which then you took up on the store and sold. Then you light the gas and it'll ripen the blinds up and they'd be ready for Friday and Saturday. And they'd be cooking all the winkles. And you can see all their faces in there, around the table going, <laughs> and they'd be all there trying to nick a tater or something. <laughs> and you'd hear all the winkles screaming on a, on a Saturday night. <laughs> and when we cooked the crabs, they used to be crabs like that. Now you get crabs like this. You know, what happened to all the crabs like that? They, they've ripped the seas, haven't they? They've ripped all the food out. Everything's ripped out. One stall used to keep three families. Used to keep my father's family, my uncle John, John, and my uncle Jack's family. The other half of John's family had come from the Low Countries as Huguenot refugees. But by the beginning of the 19th century, they'd set down roots in Deptford. Both sides of the family had made their money in fish and greengrocery. They set up home in Reginald Road, which Booth's map marks as pink for comfortable. It was the most respectable of the side turnings running off the high street. There was quite a few wealthy people in the turning, including my father and my aunt. If you try and find somebody who's poor down Reginald Road, no, there was no one poor down Reginald Road. A goods yard connects Reginald Road to Hale Street, where more of the Price and Ovenall families lived. But just a few yards from Reginald, Hale Street dropped way down the social scale. Booth mapped it as a mix of the very poor and the vicious and semi-criminal. It's a reputation that stayed with the street long into the next century. See, if you go back in time, Owl Street was very much uncontrollable. But Owl Street was a complete, utter slum with every crook you could possibly imagine who used to live in Owl Street. But the council really wanted Owl Street pulled down because it was a den of thieves. When Charles Booth arrives on Hale Street and Reginald Road, he finds people occupying the houses in tenement conditions, renting from a landlord, entire families in a single room. People eat, sleep and wash in the same room. The nicest place anyone has to escape to is the pub. Aware of the rapid spread of the drink culture amongst the working class, Booth produces a map of London's several thousand pubs. It shows Deptford High Street with 12. It's a disconcerting discovery for Booth, who's convinced that drink dependency is wrecking Deptford's neighborhoods. Well, that used to be the 45. It was a red line and wheat sheep, but because it was number 45, we always called it the 45. Lively pub, was it? Yeah, yeah, one long bar, that was all, one long bar. You drink Guinness all day long, my Uncle John. Never ever got drunk. As soon as the off licence was open, my job was going to get six bottles of Guinness. And then when he had them, I, as I come out of school, I used to go up there and get another six bottles of Guinness. And then by the night time, there was another six bottles of Guinness. 
And then as soon as he was down here washing shave and go in the Deptford Arms, and he'd have another load of Guinness. He was never ever drunk. In the aftermath of the Second World War, the London County Council sets out to assess the devastation by drafting a series of bomb damage maps. Again, black marks the most devastated streets, the ones that have been totally destroyed. But by sheer chance, the high street escapes unscathed. Post-war prosperity rejuvenates Deptford. Deptford's never had it so good. Money's being made, and people are spending it on the high street. This store, there'd, there'd be 100 people around it, all screaming and hollering and fighting, and I'm next, and this is mine. And... In, it, in its heyday, there was very, very good shops in Deptford High Street. It was very, very easy to earn a living. If you was a, a fit person able to work, then you had money because there was plenty of work in Deptford. You just walked out of your house and you, you went into work. When I got washed and changed, you went out to pubs. There's so, so many pubs in Deptford because people had money. The side streets are changing too. Deptford people have started to buy the houses they once rented and families have a whole house to themselves. The tenement dwellers are becoming owner-occupiers. You had a house years ago, your grandmother lived in it, and normally the eldest daughter, or the eldest son that we got, he stayed in the house with the mother. But the eldest daughter, or wherever it was, then took over and looked after mummy and daddy. It all stayed in the family, and the place just got handed down all the way through, all the way through. Never had a toilet in the house. There's no toilets in the house. It was all in the yard. There was no, because they didn't think of toilet in the house. Oh, terrible. Got to have it in the yard. What they did then is downstairs, they'd done away with the old wash house and put a bathroom and a toilet in there. On so top. people were improving their houses for themselves? Yeah, oh yeah. The places were spotless. The streets were spotless. As outside the house, and all the knockers used to be cleaned and all the letterboxes used to be cleaned. They couldn't help it. I stand there every morning, they couldn't help it. It's a ritual. Oh, I've got to do my step, I don't want to see my step up, you know, next door and all that. It was like that, proud. Yeah, oh, see a dirty, oh, no, I don't want her to talk about me, you know. That's how they was. But the planners fail to notice how people are improving their homes. They make a propaganda film, arguing for the destruction of 19th century London. And they come to Deptford to shoot it. Pubs, schools and churches are all jumbled up together in a hopeless confusion. And you will see mean, hideous slums of which any city ought to be ashamed. Row upon row of dirty, dismal houses that should have been pulled down and done away with long ago. All these bad things must go, and the sooner the better. You see, the trouble is that London grew up without any plan or order. That's why there are all those bad and ugly things that we hope to do away with if this plan of ours is carried out. The driving forces behind this film are the town planning guru Sir Patrick Abercrombie and John Forshaw, chief architect for the London County Council. Abercrombie and Forshaw have been influenced by the European modernists with their theory of the city as a machine. Working for the London County Council, they published the County of London Plan, a plan for a futuristic, reimagined London. And that brings us to another aspect of London. London as a machine, a vast machine. Booth's chaotic, random city is to be removed, replaced by a rationalised, machine-like metropolis. The plan is for London to be destroyed and re-engineered, each neighbourhood given a single defined purpose within the vast mechanism. Deptford, along with most of East and South London, is identified as a community with a high proportion of obsolescent property. It's earmarked for widespread demolition and the creation of efficient new tower blocks. Chelsea and Kensington, along with the rest of West and North London, are to be left untouched, 
No need for wholesale demolition in these areas. A vast modernist social experiment is to be carried out in the working class East and South. It's a pretty gigantic scheme affecting the future of the whole of London. Behind it all was the rhetoric of modern architecture. There was this huge rhetoric which architects had absorbed in their training at schools of architecture. The people who lectured to them were not practicing architects, but were, but were sort of rhetorical gurus. Um, uh, and, and these rhetorical gurus <laughs> preached. You can imagine an 18-year-old student getting very excited by all this. People did get very excited. This was the future. And they didn't talk to anybody in Deptford about it, and they talked amongst themselves. Well, let's deal with the worst places first. Some of the areas in most urgent need of attention are the industrial boroughs in the east and south of London. Let's look at the roads as they are now. The streets are narrow and winding. Our chief aim must be to separate fast, long-distance traffic from local traffic. Prompted by the planners, who want to open up more of London's roads to the motor car, Deptford Council comes up with a plan to close down its market. How long have you been here? 65 years. Bread and bone in this town, 75 years. What will you do if the market closes? Well, I'll have to go thieving, mate, won't I? What will you do if it is closed? Oh, I don't know what we do. We've never done nothing else on Equally Grocery all our lives and parents before us. Well, I think it's bad. We've lived here all our life and these stalls have been round here as long as I've known. Does it block traffic, sir? Well, no, I don't think I know. We've got nothing to do with traffic. We're going to fight our case against the Deptford Borough Council. Whoever this person is, he sets himself up as a dictator of Deptford and we're definitely not going to stand for it. Council's plans are defeated and the market is saved. It's a little victory for the high street and its people. But even as this battle is won, plans for a reordered Deptford are taking shape behind closed doors. A series of maps of the high street and its turnings are drawn up by both Deptford and the London County Council. Lost to the archives for 60 years, they've just been rediscovered. The maps show the side streets designated for slum clearance, marking in black and red the houses to be demolished. The residents weren't shown these maps, and they were never consulted about the plans to pull down their streets. The clearance maps expose a plan to erase Charles Booth's Deptford. It's the single most revolutionary change in Deptford's history near total destruction of its part. Well, I got involved as an architectural historian. I was elected to the council. I was the architectural and planning correspondent of the Sunday Times. My friends saw me disappearing into some obscure byway of a squalid municipal socialism. I had them saying to me, how do you find it getting, getting on with working class people? <laughs> A letter from the architect's department about a possible housing site in Forest Hill, a difficult one. It's the site of an existing church and questions whether the adjoining houses are going to be pulled down or rehabilitated. There was an overwhelming desire in the 1960s to sweep everything away. People kept on saying that this is, this is the 20th century. Instead of grotty old buildings, what you must have is uh, stainless steel kitchens with four mica tops. And those are the things which show that you're, you're, you're being modern, you're being up to date, you're being progressive.
will this mean that some of us have got to move, then? Yes, I'm afraid some of you will have to move. And the point of the inspector's look round is to see how clean they are. It all goes down on the form. They had a form they filled in, in which they made what you might call social and moral remarks about the family. They talked about the family's lifestyle. They made an appointment to say somebody would be coming round. <laughs> a lot of the people said, well, I won't be in for a start. And you get another one saying, but if they think they're getting me out, you know, and that, that's how it would be. But eventually, the council did come round and see what property you had, looking all over it. I remember the man coming to my mum's and saying, what was you thinking of doing here? And she said, well, I'm going to try and put a bathroom in if I can. She said, because if you think we can stay longer, because we've got a bathroom, we'll do it. These houses never had bathrooms in. That's all they never had. There was three bedrooms, four bedrooms, two living rooms, downstairs. There was plenty of room to put a bathroom, but they never had bathrooms. And because they never had bathrooms, they called them slums. I have to be clear with you that a lot of the houses that were cleared really had to be cleared. I mean, they were too far gone. They had terrible rising damp. Uh, there were problems in the structure of the houses. Um, uh, deep deep damp basements, which we had a whole lot in Deptford, including on the north side of Reginald Road. I mean, they were, whichever way you looked at them, they were little damp houses with some really, really nice people living in some of them. But they were little damp houses. Well, if he was on the council at the time, I know how old I am now and how old I was then, he was either very young to be on the council or he's very old now and perhaps his memory's going a bit. I can't remember the conditions that he's talking about. He must have been talking about a, a different area to where I lived. But they weren't slums. There's, there's places over at Fulham, similar type of houses and just as old. They didn't pull them down. Well, I'm back to see. In some parts of Chelsea, the houses are older. But because it's where it is, and they have got an indoor toilet now, although some of them, they wouldn't admit it, but there was only a third or fourth bedroom being converted. They just wanted doing art. They're old houses. It wasn't a problem. The ones they left are not a problem. Are they making half a million pound and a million pound now? You know, it's ridiculous. And they're, they're going to be there for another hundred years. They just won't fall down, will they? The environmental health officers were not surveyors or architects. They were looking at condi the conditions in which people were living. And they very often made, made sweeping judgments about the buildings when actually they didn't actually know a lot about buildings. They, know much, they knew much more about the conditions in which people were living. And seen from the social heights of professional people who plan slum clearance and design new buildings, one working class street looks much like another. In fact, the style of life lived in them varies from extremes of respectability to shiftlessness and downright criminality. November 1964, environmental health officers condemn Reginald Road as unfit for human habitation. The Price and Ovenall families are issued with compulsory purchase orders and offered around £1,600 for their homes. Along with many others, they refuse to leave. It happened to Aunt Bol at first. She lived down Howe Street and they pulled all down round her and she lived in this house in Howe Street on her own. Just rubble all around. It's come wasteland and the house was sitting in the middle. And of course, you know, you had where they pulled down, then you suddenly got vermin everywhere, haven't you? Nobody wants to go down there overnight because all the lights are out. Next week we're pulling down next door. And now they pull down next door and someone cuts the pipe. Now what happens? Now you've got no water. Now she becomes slums. They then create the slums. And of course now they've knocked down next door. Now half of your roof is open to the elements. <laughs> and now the rain comes in and your ceiling falls down. Now, now the bloke comes round to value your house and he says, oh, the ceiling's fell down and the wall's all damp, and we ain't going to give you no money. Now how do you feel? 
how do you feel with that man who's told you your house is now falling to bits because what they've done either side of you? We was in our house for about two years with everything knocked down around us because we didn't want to move. Any idea of staying by then was absolutely hopeless. It was a sort of long drawn out war of attrition, um, the clearance of these areas. It didn't happen overnight. It took years and years and years. War of attrition and because some people refused to leave. Yes, and just because the bureaucratic processes took so long. But I do have to say that most people wanted to get out. And the, and, and the, by and, that stage, if yeah. your street's being boarded up and it's covered with corrugated iron, oh, it's and dreadful. People, of course you don't want to stay in your street. No, that's right. That's right, of course. People would want to live in a street. I, 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 that's exactly, that's what I'm saying to you. I understood all these things and, and my heart was <laughs> bleeding daily. I can't think of anybody that really wanted to move, anybody that was really pleased about it. I can't remember anybody coming up and saying, oh, isn't it, isn't it good, you know, we're moving. It's upsetting for a lot of people. For all sake, like family Nellie Pearson lives, she kept it all nice. And then once she's moved out, you, you, you see a window gets broken or a, the curtain's flapping out the window. Straight away, the, the turning does start to go down very quickly. Then a lot of people want to start moving quickly, see, because they don't want to be the last sort of half a dozen or so. But once they started pulling down, they got older street by street by street. And then by around about 1960, 65, 66, 67, the whole area was flat. And our stall from taking good money was taking no money. We'd stand up there all day and take a pound or something like that. Over the next 20 years, a thousand people a week will have to load up the moving vans and head for the new towns clean, neat and antiseptic. What they have real grounds to complain about is the feeling that in exchange for their new house, they've given up something, something important, something that meant home. I'm not the type to be on my own all the time, you know. I mean, I've got no friends come up here or anything like that, you know, to see me or call in for a cup of tea and I'm just on my own all day and I used to cry every day until my husband sent me over the doctor and he gave me pills and all that. Mum just lived across the road, I know, and even my old gran lives in the same house where I was born. Your mother lived very near? Oh, I see my mother every day. I mean, there wasn't a day went past when I didn't see my mother. She either came over to me or I went over to her. I very often get bored. Why I mean, I'd go out and smash things in temper rather than have rows with my husband, which I have done in the past. Has it made it difficult between you and your husband because the, you've been upset since you've moved here? Well, I try not to, for his sake. He has to live, uh, work long hours and I try and be happy. But, I mean, very often he's come home and found me crying and I can't explain why. It's just the fit of depression you get into. We ended up with Jolton, and Aunt Harriet ended up with Broccoli, and Aunt Violet ended up with Greenwich, and Aunt Grace ended up with Woolwich, and Uncle John ended up with Broccoli. So from everybody living here, they all, we had to move out, that's it, you, you had to go. There was no way to live down there, was there? There was nowhere to live. The family still stayed very, very strong together. But um, eventually it just breaks up and breaks up, doesn't it? More and more and more. There is a misty-eyed view of the past. There was a golden age, do you know? Uh, um, there wasn't. <laughs> I, the, I've never, I, I, I've certainly never, never been, been in any golden age. I mean, although people actually uh, settle down remarkably quickly in somewhere new, uh, sometimes people feel guilty simply because they have settled down so happily in, in Brockley or Grove Park or Bexley Heath. Uh, they've settled down there so happily and they feel a certain sense of guilt. They feel that they really should be with the folks back home. Uh, regardless of the fact the folks back home are also living in Bexley Heath, Brockley, Grove Park and so on. They started pulling opposite us down. 
and my mum stayed as long as she could. She loved Deptford and wanted to just be left alone. We was the last to come down and I hated moving from there. I've been here years and I'm just adjusting. Council replaces Reginald's Victorian terraces with a low-rise block. Deptford streets of rubble start to disappear as the GLC and Lewisham Council build estates to replace the terraced houses they've torn down. Those who have refused to move out to the suburbs are being rehoused here. In Deptford, even the new homes that have been built are under attack. Now, that's where you live, right at the top there. Yes, yes. What do you think of living up there? Well, um, my husband, since I've lived up there, my husband's had a nervous breakdown, and my children have got nowhere to play. And if I want to come down, I can't leave my children with my husband. A lot of my older council colleagues couldn't understand why people were so ungrateful. I remember one of them saying to me, but they've got wonderful, lovely kitchens, lovely bathrooms. You know, what are they complaining about? And, uh, and why are these people so ungrateful when we've given them these wonderful places to live in? Even though he was living in a big Victorian house up the hill. The first big high-rise estate in Deptford, the Evelyn estate, uh, everybody moved into quite happily, and uh, that was finished in, uh, in 1970, the year before I was elected but people were unhappy. And so the other big high-rise estate, the Milton Court estate, when that was finished in 1973, um, a lot of people didn't want to move there, uh, particularly the, the high-rise blocks. The flats became hard to let. It was extraordinary. Here were brand new, brand new flats in brand new blocks that people didn't want to have. And we had to go way, way, way down the housing list in order to find people who'd take them. The council can't find enough Deptford-born people who want to live in the new estates. So they start to look further afield for tenants willing to settle in the new blocks. And so a new wave of Deptford people begins to fill the side turnings. I come over here in 1976. 1976, did you? Yeah. My wife said to me, Hedy, this is London. I said, yeah. So I coming through the plane door now, as I step through the plane door, man, going, man, through the plane door. Reach London. <laughs> when I feel the cold, I go this way, you know. You want to step in back, Eddie? She said, oh, no, go take the cold, take us to the you know. You go out, take the cold, go London. <laughs> yeah. She said, take it, Right, Archie. Yeah. Have a listen. <laughs> Wait, what do you mean you lost your money? No, no, come on, you can't have it. Last week he came in, he had no money, so I lent him the money. He promised me to pay me back yeah. Monday. And he kept borrowing 30 yeah. quid and 20 quid and 30 quid. And he said, I've got the money coming and I'll give it back to you Monday. Well, you know how this feels. I've yeah. been doing it for years, uh, uh, didn't he? He's been doing it for years. But yeah, I, I it, it's, it, it, yeah. it's funny enough that it's funny he's got to big money and suddenly he goes <laughs> yeah. and gets mugged. <laughs> this man here, Archie, get, get mugged. <laughs> How can he go and get mugged? He, no, everybody in London knows Archie. <laughs> Here in the morning, right? And two blokes on a bike just come up. I don't have it in there and grab it. But I was over the next side watching me and I never know. He's got a steel plate in his head where he got bombed in the war. No, no, Suez. Suez Canal. 1956. 1956. I'm going to move the plate in a minute to get the money out of him. <laughs> I stabbed him there so we'd be in it, right? Stabbed him there. And, and I shot him along and everything. Were you in the army? army? Yeah, 12, yeah, 12 years. I stole away from Jamaica, come here. I did 28 days in Saint prison. That time with the young offenders. I was 15. I leave from there and I went to... The, the morning when I released from the 28 days, there was a minute, the military police waiting for me. Take me straight to Aldershot. I went to Malaya, then Suez, 1956, and it destroyed me. 
course, you was here in 1960, wasn't you, when I was there, growing up? There, there. That's um, right. I remember. That's right, when I had a jag. There. I had a jag. No black man could go in that pub. No, I don't have pub over there. Yeah, and I went in there, and they, they, they took me out and I got up there and shoot the pub up. I got three years for that. That's right, you got three years for shooting the pub up. Over there, it used to be called a Duke of Cain. Yeah. I, I used to use it when I was a boy. And me and my friend oh, and my, and my go wife the went in there. They said, the only way you can get a drink is if you're going to the toilet. Come back there about a couple of nights like, after. Yeah, and I said, which one do you want some of this, right? Say, and the women them saw the chamber. Oh, tell me, you can come here any time. So I just said, well, I'll show you what I mean. Look! <laughs> Ceiling come down. <laughs> so you didn't shoot nobody, just the ceiling. No, I don't want to kill everybody in here. <laughs> oh, what, ma'am? Have a look round, darling. How long have you been working on the high street here? All my life. How long's that? Oh, sixty years, I suppose. The original people who lived here, none of them here anymore. You don't see any of them now. About five percent. Like the old timers, the old people who lived here, the old British people, they're not here anymore. The fish we used to sell, like cod fillet and all that, we don't sell hardly any now. We used to sell, I don't know, two, three hundred stone of cod fillet a week. We sell about four now. And why is that? Because it's the different, different people. They I don't eat it. sell them immediately. Now, 200 now? The ethnics. They, they love fish and they love fish hole with the heads on. I mean, years ago, we wouldn't dream of having fish with the heads on. They'd have the head cut off and thrown away, you know. But they love eating the heads. But where have they all gone, all the original South Londoners? Where have they all gone? Moved out. Oh, that hurts, doesn't it? That's got her, it's got her. David, it's got her. What, what one? My yeah, can't, she won't do it again. Yeah, what do you right? want to take a photo of that, mate? Yeah, look. Take a photo of that. Is that one? What she's doing now? No, Zoom in on that. <laughs> Okay, no, I'll take it. 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 Broken, She's crying, broken, yeah. yeah? Yeah. You want a bandage? You want a bandage? It crushed it to bits, isn't it? They won't let go. You are, boss? Oh, there it goes. He won't have that, he won't have that. He won't have that, he won't have that, he won't have that, he won't have it. He won't have it, will he? Oh, here we go, it's off. It's an angry eye street, mate. No one likes anyone down here. The spread of the housing blocks ushers in a new Deptford. Those who can afford it join the exodus to the suburbs. Hold on, I love you. The high street is left, marooned amongst low quality council blocks, lived in by people on low incomes. These flats can't be gentrified, so those who do well tend to move away leaving behind the people that Booth would have ranked at the bottom of the social scale. With its once prosperous community displaced, the high street has slid back, from well-to-do red to poor and very poor. Just across the Thames from the high-rise new money of Docklands lies Deptford. It's one of London's most deprived areas. In some parts of the high street, there are nearly as many closed or derelict shops as there are places open for business. The sons and the daughters uh, moved out, and the old ones all stayed here and died. All dead now, aren't they? I think there's, I think there's about a handful left, if that. Once they started pulling everything down, it went down. And as we're sitting here, the clock is ticking and nothing's going in the till. Nothing at all is going in the till. 
This is very scary. Since Charles Booth's visit here, the high street's other great business has declined dramatically. Today, the number of pubs is down from 12 to two. The Deptford Arms, once the meeting place of a revolutionary group run by the man who wrote the red flag, is now a bookies. The Mechanics Arms and the Royal Oak are African restaurants. The Pilot is a nail shop. The Windsor Castle is a center for teenagers with problems, and the Red Cow, which once doubled as the coroner's court, is now a cost cutter. But despite the draining away of traditional pub culture, the people of Deptford are still coming to the high street to drink. Only now, it's mostly on the street, keeping up an ancient tradition of hard drinking that reaches deep into Deptford's past. There's something that keep on drawing me towards Deptford. There are spot right now in Devon Market. Somebody is always drunk. When things are prevailing in one place for so many years, it's a clear indication that some years ago, something unique has happened there. Like in Deptford, there's something unique that has happened over 100 and 200 years ago. So based on that, it keep on reoccurring, reoccurring. When people are congregating in one place, drinking there, automatically they have built an altar there. They don't know why they're there, but they just want to sit there. Even though it's filthy, it's dirty, they don't care. Because there's an evil altar that is, is pulling them to go there. Your kingdom has come. The kingdom of our Lord Jesus. There are things that is happening right now in Deford Market that is very, very demonic. The devil gave them assignment. You demon in charge of uh, death for. Your assignment is to make sure that every day get people drunk. In the name of Jesus, we speak peace in this place. In the name of Jesus, every altar here, every altar that is not of God. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, Holy Spirit of God, let that be changed in Jesus' name. The kingdom of Jesus has come into this place. Let your kingdom, the kingdom rule. We call it spiritual mapping. When they are sleeping in the night, we pass by their house, we begin to pray. We speak to the air. We take authority over every negative forces. I come with deliverance. Take over this building right now. Have your way over this building right now. Shabo dalabo sikat dalabo tule baha. Man dalabo zodo baha. Father, every altar that has been built in this place that will cause problem here, we can't see in Jesus' name. We break every power of ruling power. Ruling power. The ruling power. Something happened here some years ago. Yeah, yeah. This is Reginald Road. And um, the, the Victorian terrace on the, on the other side had already gone by the time I became a councillor. Um, there, was, there was a terrace of houses here, you're quite right, which were in an advanced state of decay. We've spoken to people that lived on this street, yes. on the Victorian houses, yes. and they don't agree that the houses were in a state of disrepair. Well, you should see. Even the picture you showed me of them showed what a what a state of what a state of disrepair they were in. Um, they were well. Th that's uh, th th all, 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 uh, that all went through a process of public inquiry and all the rest of it, and uh, it, it was um, uh, agreed that they uh, they should come down. Uh, no, but the, the, the houses were not in a state of disrepair. In your opinion? No, actually, in the <laughs> opinion of. Yes. The council officers that came and inspected the street here. 2012. The documents lost in the council archives are discovered. Notes written by council officers as they inspect Reginald Road 
anxious to please their bosses by declaring it a slum. But the council officers can't find a genuine reason to declare Reginald Road as unfit for human habitation. At number 42, home of the Price family, the officer says, damp, there is no damp. Repair, there is no disrepair. All defects remediable at not too great a cost. There is no doubt in my mind that this whole street could be dealt with by means other than slum clearance, if the council want to. The health inspector's verdicts are kept private. Three years on, Reginald is declared a slum and residents are instructed to leave. Gracious. Dear, dear, dear. I just feel amazed, really, that, that this has come to light now, after all these years. And you wonder who are these people when they've been told structurally that the house is OK to live in. And then all of a sudden, they're going against what they said, but nobody knows what they've said because it doesn't come out, does it? Um, just the letter. Saying, just the letter saying, yeah. Your house is a slum. Mm. My mum had lovely curtains. As I'm growing up, I wanted to fight a council, but you couldn't fight them. Do you understand? My uncle John, he don't want to move. Big, strong man. Some little creep's going to come along and tell him he's got to get out. And then the creep hides behind a bloody door and sends bloody bulldozers in. We had it, bulldozers knocking the top of the corner up and then coming in and saying, oh, that was an accident. And then you try and fight them. Who are you going to fight? You're going to fight. You can't fight no one. You're going out of town hall, some bird on the office desk banging your head, which you can't take any notice of you. You can't even get to them. If you go to Greenwich, now, all them houses over in Greenwich are exactly the same as the ones that stood in Deptford, for some unknown reason that no one will ever probably get the truth to. They wanted to condemn Deptford. Councillor Taylor isn't responsible for pulling down Reginald Road. He joined the council some time after the compulsory purchase orders had already been issued. But he is convinced that the houses on Reginald had to come down and that the council made the right decision. Because we found some yeah. of the documents and these are the council's own medical officers who are going up and down yes, the street yes, that's right. oh, looking no. for reasons to declare them a unfit for human habitation. That's right. They're slums. Slums, and part three of the Housing Act. No, no. It well, says the here, reason. Number 42. The reason? The Price family of number 42. Yeah. Repair, there is no disrepair. Yeah. Dampness, there is no dampness. Yes. Uh, any defects remediable at not too great a cost. You're number talking on. about one row of houses. The council's own officer says. You're talking about. Is good. Yeah, I'm not. Uh, I'm not denying that. Maintaining these houses. I'm not denying that. Very well kept and may be difficult to declare a slum. I'm not denying that. Look, I'm not defending that. Um, maybe those ones should have been kept. I, I of course set out. I, it was very difficult to stop the bulldozer. When I was elected, I couldn't stop the bulldozer over. I had to persuade my colleagues. Most of my colleagues wanted to continue bulldozing, and therefore, in order to persuade them to stop bulldozing, you had to select where you're going to make your stand. It was a very difficult area to redevelop this. Very, very difficult to redevelop. But there is one side street visited by Charles Booth that had a different fate. Albury Street, running off the high street to the north of Reginald and classed by Booth as mixed with ordinary working people and some artisans. Albury was originally built in 1700 for sea captains and the well-to-do. But by the time of Booth's survey, it was no longer what it had once been. And over the next 70 years, it continued to drop down the social scale. By 1960, Albury was a genuine slum in a worse state than Reginald. Its residents were evicted and Albury too 
was scheduled for slum clearance. But a quirk of the planning process left Aubrey escaping the bulldozer, and it didn't get pulled down. It's still here today, running off the high street, the last vestige of old Deptford. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Straight away, it's, it's, a bit like, it's a bit like a sort of country house in miniature, isn't it, here? And you've got this lovely sort of this hall going right through the house. And then this is the main downstairs reception room. Oh, what do you think? Wow. Nicely done. And I, I would know which picture I'd ask my dad for to put above the Other fireplace. Purpose. Yes. It's quite stylish, isn't it? Mm, very. A lot of the staircases original, you've got these lovely sort of barley twist um, banisters here. Oh, I love that turning. Isn't it lovely? And then this, to me, I oh, think this is... This is awesome. This is, I think this is the loveliest room in the house, this mm. one. It really feels like a piano noble. It, it is like a exactly, piano noble, exactly. Could it, it could even be a, a bit another big reception room up here, couldn't it? And I suppose that could make the downstairs living room more of a kind of casual dining stroke living room. Exactly, exactly that. Exactly. So this could be more of a sort of state dining room mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for important occasions. Well, <laughs> When I grew up, we did have the family dining room and the formal dining room. Oh, well, quite right. Well, I think you need to, we need to have that in Deptford. London evolves, doesn't it? Absolutely. And, it somehow, has. and somehow this little street's still here. You know, a precious little survival amongst it all. Well, the price for this house at the moment, I think it's on the market for about £750,000. <laughs> <laughs> it's great value for what it is. Do you think so? Well, I, I do think so in terms of the quality of the restoration yeah. and the neighbourhood isn't likely to change dramatically in the next few years, just judging by the stability of the community around here. That means a lot. It's Pauline's wedding. I think it was Pauline's wedding, isn't it? Hey? Yeah, it's Uncle Jack there. Dear, oh dear, oh dear. God. Yeah. Oh, it's Aunt Harriet, look. Yeah, he's loading up the lorry there. Yeah, I think that was me. It is me. Yeah. In the baskets would have been Jersey potatoes. It's another time, isn't it? It's another era. You can't turn back the clock no more, can you? Tick tock, tick tock. I think light finish now, son. Yeah? Can we finish now? tell the story of Camberwell Grove, how the street was built for the middle classes in Georgian times. When it was built, it was almost like an object landed from space in the farmland itself. 
how it was engulfed by the Victorian city of London, and how, as period houses were being demolished all over the city, the fight began to protect the grove. To discover more about Britain's secret streets, the Open University has produced a free guidebook. Go to bbc.co.uk slash ourstreets and follow the links to the Open University or call 0845 366 0251. And to read what director Joseph Bullman says about making the secret history of our streets, try this, bbc.co.uk slash TV blog. Disco Classics, next on BBC Two, the sights and sounds of the 70s.